Hi, this is the Magnificent Midlife Podcast and I'm Rachel Lancaster. This is where we celebrate women in midlife and beyond. We challenge the status quo and bash those negative stereotypes about being an older woman. We're not over the hill at 40, 50, 60. We're just getting started. And the world needs us now more than ever. I'll be talking all things midlife, about issues that matter, and sharing fabulous stories of amazing women doing very cool stuff. Now is our time. I'm super excited today to interview Mia Mojé. She's a 56-year-old model and influencer. She burst onto the scene in 2020 in the midst of the global pandemic when she was picked up by a modelling agency allowing her to leave her career in digital marketing and PR. She's passionate about occupying spaces previously reserved for those that look nothing like her, be that her hair texture and colour, age, skin tone or body type. We met doing a menopause video together for QVC. And as I've been researching Mia, I have discovered so much amazing stuff, which we're going to dig into. What a fascinating life this woman has had. Welcome, Mia. Hello. Thank you for having me. (laughs) I'm very excited to dig into your very interesting life. And I'd like to go right back to the early years to start with, if I may, and ask about your first experiences of black power as a mixed race child of the Windrush generation growing up in the 70s. Um, my first experiences. Um, so uh, I would say I was very lucky and fortunate to grow up in a in kind of in a bubble, I suppose, of black pride ideology. So I had a very good support system and I felt very uh, confident about my identity in the world and very well equipped to deal with what I might have to face as a child of the 70s and as a child of mixed parentage. Um, my, we were one, I was part of the first of a generation to go, you know, second generation of um of children to go through the education system on on mass um and so that was interesting i was fortunate enough to have a black head teacher one of the very few i think she was one of the first her name was beryl gilroy and she was the most amazing activist which i learned um more recently actually she's been celebrated a lot more recently um they had an exhibition at the british museum the british is that the one in king's cross i can't remember what it's called the British British Library. Library, you thank British you. Library? Yes, the British <laughs> Library, which I should be, I should know. My daughter worked on the um, the artwork for it. She's a graphic designer, so I should have known that. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, there was a lovely exhibition there for her. So yeah, I had a very positive route. Um, I did have, you know, there was sort of name calling in the playground and that sort of thing, but that was just the climate. We, you know, there was graffiti on the walls from the National Front were quite prevalent. Uh, but to counter that, I was, you know, very proactive and uh, we went on demonstrations as children. I knew about the police brutality existed in my community. You know, I was very, very rooted in, in that ideology and that pride and, um, and understanding of how to navigate the world as a, as a minority. And how do you feel that has extended into your life after childhood? I mean, does it... Has it, presumably, has it been some sort of real strong core for you? Um, absolutely. I've, most of my work and my jobs have been around uh, creating platforms for my community, really. Um, I, I sort of discovered, I didn't go to uni. I discovered that I could write really through a love of music. My dad was a musician. So we had, my mum was a music lover. We had music all around around us as a family and it was a big part of my my life so I had a love of music and through that love of music and wanting to be in the scene I became a photographer firstly I did a short course in photography and then kind of blagged my way into getting press passes and all of that so I could get up close and personal and get front row seats and all of that great stuff and get invited to parties and then I was at a meeting for a magazine and came up with an idea for an article and I always loved to write but I never thought I could make a career of it and my the editor of the magazine said why don't you write 
the piece you've made it's a really good idea why don't you write it and I was like well I could so I did and then discovered that I loved writing so um and that I was quite good at it and so I then became worked my way this magazine was a magazine that uh covered what was then known as black music it's now urban music and is very mainstream now but at that time the landscape was you know it was very different it, there was we weren't there was no but marketing budgets for for black music at that time and it wasn't covered by mainstream radio it wasn't covered by mainstream uh, media either so I was very uh, passionate about that so I suppose that comes from my background and my you know the way I was raised as well just feeling driven by making change and giving uh, and elevating and creating platforms for underrepresented uh, sections of our society, I suppose, where we weren't represented enough. So I did that. I then was approached by the MOBO Awards, which is a uh, music of black origin awards, which again was set up in that climate where there was no representation, adequate representation. And, um, and I worked with them on and off for over 10 years whilst I had my kids and um, I kept a toe in the water there. And then I worked for Notting Hill Carnival. And these were really, I mean, I've had jobs in between, but these were the longest jobs that I'd had. And I was approached by Notting Hill Carnival to, again, to challenge the negative narrative in the media and to give it its due respect. And um, that was marketing and PR and digital. So I kind of, it's a very small team, so I was spinning lots of plates. But again, it was very much that meant everything to me to be doing that job. My dad was one of the founders of Notting Hill Carnival and it had just been slurred and kicked about uh, around by the media for so long and 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 it was so unfair and unwarranted i mean once i got in there i realized why and it was because there was no communication between the organizers and the media and the media were being fed the stats the crime stats every year by the police just by standard they just blanket email the 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 media with the stats and so that's the only story they had it would just be carnival took place and there were 500 arrests or whatever it was 200 arrests and that would be it we wouldn't get any other coverage but once we got in there they were very open to hearing our story and I like to think you know we as a team made made a big difference in the last because I, I went on came on board in 2018 and then I left in 2021 and I was very sad to leave but also you know it was a new beginning so it got me to where I am now, which is, I suppose I just like to kind of shake things up wherever I go, really. I mean, that's what it sounds like. And I, you know, and I really, I came onto social media really with the intention of just being present and being vocal and being visible as looking the way that I do and, and, and to also connect with other women that felt ignored by brands, particularly in beauty and fashion. And that was my only motivation for coming onto social media was just to be noisy I think <laughs> and to connect, connect with people like you that were equally noisy so yeah that, and that brings us to today I think it's really interesting because as, as a white woman as a very privileged white woman I've only discovered my passion for shaking things up in midlife I didn't really have it before. I just towed the line. I did what I was supposed to do. Yeah. And I didn't really think about it. So when I look at what you've done and what your experience has led you to, and from such a young age, I just think, oh, I wasted my life. I, yeah. wish, I wish I'd been doing, I mean, not that I'd wasted it, but I wish I'd been yeah. doing more earlier because yeah. it took, I mean, and it's good. I suppose my life led me to where I am now. And as you say, I like making lots of noise now. And I like to say, no, <laughs> this is wrong. And no, we're not going to do this. And no, we're going to change the narrative, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But I think it's, it's really interesting for me to see how your early life impacted you so much and and it, I suppose pushed you down that that route of of shaking things up oh absolutely I, I I do think you know I was really lucky I don't know if I mentioned but um there's a an activist that you may or may not have heard of um called Dark as Howe who was very prevalent I mean he was one of the Mangrove Nine which was recently been covered by a Steve McQueen film so he basically you know I he lived downstairs he lived in a block of six flats 
and he lived downstairs. He knew my dad from Trinidad as well. So, uh, and my dad died when I was 18 and he very much kind of, he, he just saw himself as a father figure to me as well. So I'd known him since the age of four, that voice, that presence had been in my life until he died in, in 2017, which was, so I, I definitely credit him with giving me, you know, that kind of sense of purpose and sense of, um, I suppose it's just fieriness that just, yeah, just wanting to, to not accept what everything that society tells you. I mean, today uh, it, the focus is on beauty standards and, and, uh, and representation and, and all those things, but it's still the same kind of action and, and passion, I suppose, you know, to, just to, to make change. Well, it's a new life phase for you, isn't it? And I, I, you know, it really is. It really is. It's uh, yeah. There's been. I, it's funny. I I only recently looked back at just from having conversations like this. Really thought about the theme, the common theme throughout my life. I hadn't actually considered it before. I'd just done it and not thought anything of it. And I think, yeah, I definitely credit Darkest with a lot of that. I get emotional thinking about him oh <laughs> yeah no he's he meant yeah. he did a lot he did a lot for us as a community for us all as a society and for me as an individual well thank you so much for sharing that I mean I think it's it's really powerful and it's it's lovely to hear somebody's life story and how it's brought them to a particular point and I know you know you haven't been a model for very long so I'd love no. now to to find out how how did that happen well, and, and what has it been like? I'm going to do something really unmodelly, and I'm going to wipe my nose because I just got really emotional <laughs> talking about darkness. Aww. Yeah, um, so, um, we the, like we like emotions on this podcast. Oh, you get a lot of company. emotion you, from Usually, me. it's me who sobs. Yeah, so don't worry about it. Um, yeah, so I, the modelling came about as a surprise. It's, it's ironic though because the cheeky teenager. Um, that went to you know at the end of your secondary school career you um you get you do your one-to-one -one with a careers advisor and the careers advisor had said what would you like to do when you leave school there was no sort of push to go into university for people like me at that time and it just didn't feel like a, a thing a natural thing for me to do so Anyway, she asked me what I'd like to do, and I blurted out, oh, I'd like to be a model. That, you know, just silly teenager that looked like fun, you know, didn't really think too much of it. And she quickly steered me into becoming a nurse. So that had happened, <laughs> and I complete, well, training to be a nurse is what was suggested. Oh, yeah. goodness, I know. Yeah. Um, I hope careers advice has moved on since then. I really I know. <laughs> um, so I didn't give it any... I didn't give it any thought after that. That was that just happened, and I kind of moved on. And then, as I when I went public with my Instagram page in 2020 during lockdown to just shout a bit about you know shopping in shops and shopping online and not seeing myself in any you know just being surrounded by imagery of young people and just how how familiar that felt to me being marginalised because I had felt that as a young woman just from from how I looked, my hair texture, my skin tone, my body type, I never saw myself represented in shops anywhere. And I was like, this is, um, that kind of, those boxes have been ticked and I was now seeing people my shape and people my colour and people with my hair texture, not my col hair colour so much, but they were young. And now I was a mature, you know, midlife, well, a woman in her 50s and, it just suddenly dawned on me, actually, this is not right. I, I don't want to be spending my money and not seeing myself, you know, not seeing myself where using creams or buying clothes or, or modelling clothes. And, and I had no intention of getting into modelling. I literally just wanted to connect with like-minded women and, 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 and galvanise, really. I thought if they're not there already, then I'll, I'll attempt to, to galvanise us and encourage people to be open and 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 to to be vocal about it so that was my intention when I went public with my page in 2020 and within the timing obviously was 
was perfect because within four weeks I had been approached by four model agencies <gasps> and I yeah <laughs> and oh my, my goodness <laughs> and my you know my my immediate response if I'm completely honest was I can't I can't be a model I like me really no it's like I don't I'm not a classic shape you know I all of those thoughts came to my mind and very quickly I said to myself well you're, you're gonna have to you have to just overcome all those insecurities that have that you felt about you know your your physical you know I've never felt body confident ever and I put that down to a lack of representation I really do so and I'm still working through that you know but I there's a lot of kind of unpacking to do with that and uh and I made I've made lots of progress since doing the modeling so um the modeling has come at the right time for me because I think had it come when I was younger I would have gone with my instinct and said oh my god I can't do that no way but now being the age that I am now and knowing the importance of it and the purpose that it has that motivates me I'm not really it's really nothing more than that that I'm like that's what makes me push through any insecurities that I feel I'm like well it's important I have to this is it's come it's I'm fortunate enough for it to have come to me and I know a lot of people from I, I get so many messages from people saying oh well you know I really want to get into modeling and how do I do it I'm really I, I'm just so lucky that it came to me and that it came at the time that it did and that it holds purpose because that's important to me, you know, that, it, that, that I'm in those spaces. Um, I did, when I, when I went public with my Instagram page, my bio strap line really was, it was, what did it say? It said something along the lines of, let's create a silver space for the next generation or something along those lines. And by silver space, I really meant a mature, you know, a midlife space for the next generation because I felt like there was nothing for me when I was young to look at and 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 want to be what have something to look forward to I feel like aging we really as we really need to make it aspirational you know I think yes. it's yeah I just yes. think it's so important <laughs> it's like it's dreaded and it's feared and I spent mm. decades fearing it you know the reason why I dyed my hair for almost 20 years it wasn't because I preferred the dye colour, which is, you know, that's absolutely fine. If people dye their hair just simply because they like it and that's their preference. Mine was this dreaded fear of being labelled. It wasn't the fear of ageing. It was the fear of society writing me off. You know, it was fear. I was single for much of my 40s and the thought of navigating the, that world with grey hair petrified me you know I worked in digital marketing and that's a very young everybody was younger than me and so I had this fear of my career being judged and, and written off there as well so so it was a deep-rooted fear of aging and you know I don't want the next generation to have that I, I you know nothing pleases me more than when I get a message Gosh, I'm such an emotional creature. Sorry about this. But when I get a message from a young person, which is something I really didn't expect out of all of this, saying, I'm so glad I found you because now I know not to fear aging. Now I know that it's okay and it's going to be okay. Now I have something to look forward to. Now I can see what I can have and be and look like. And, you know, I can still live my life and I can still be learning things and I can still be growing and evolving and developing and, and you know, and creating. Nothing pleases me more than when I hear that from a young person, you know. And that's... that's... So I told, told you I was the one that... You'd make me cry now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Look what you've done. It's not just what me then. Done. <laughs> but it, honestly, it's so important. And that's why I, you know, when we met, I immediately just looked at you and I thought wow and thank you oh. <laughs> because it's it's not just that as you say it's fear of aging but it's the internalized ageism yeah 
Yes. Because we've taken on board the ageism. Yes. And then we do it, we apply it to ourselves. Yes. That's what you were doing to yourself by Absolutely. dyeing your hair. Absolutely. Because you had taken on board those external narratives and you thought you I would had. be dismissed. Whether or not you would be, mm. we don't actually know. You possibly could have been but you had decided that you would, would be. be exactly which would mean I would be because I had that mentality do you know what I mean yes. I would have I wouldn't yes have, I wouldn't have felt strong enough to just push through the, all of all of that at that time and also I come from like my mum wouldn't tell people her age for years for decades I rem she never when I was little she didn't tell people her age her mother did the same thing you know that that is kind of generational as well it's not just and that's powerful you know that you're you're without without actually saying to me you know I'm ashamed of my age just that act of not wanting to tell people her age when it was her birthday she just simply wouldn't tell people her age and that that you know that's that's a really negative message to send mm. so there's that and then yeah and then the fear with society and and I literally I would dye my hair have like five good days and then there would be like this little glistening here along the hairline that I would cover up with a headband or a hat for a week and then that was the pattern and then I'd dye my hair again, had five or six good days, and then cover it up for a week and dye it again. And it, just exhausting. Exhausting. And it felt as if those, that glistening silver line was saying, hey, everyone, she's really old. She's old. <laughs> <laughs> she's, trying to, she's trying to hide it. She's trying to fool you. But look at this. And, and that's, it was a horrible feeling. And I remember if I ever did let it show, it, I, people would actually look at it and, and talk to the the new growth, and, <laughs> and I'd be like mortified and just and it, oh, no. there's no way and to you'd live. see them looking at it. Yeah, you'd, you'd know. Yeah. yeah, and it was just yeah, it was horrible. It was a horrible way to to exist, and I did that for a ridiculous number of years. Um, so in 2016, when I decided to let it go. I was still single and, it, you know, and I was scared to do it. But it felt like quite a radical thing to do. My daughters were my only support. Uh, they were teenagers at the time. And they, they were really my cheerleaders. I had, I think my friends and family thought I was bonkers, you know. They would, I think they really didn't get it. But my daughters were very supportive. And I, I just, I was just exhausted by it. I just was like... I had an operation actually and I had six weeks to recover and I was just a bit like the women during lockdown where I knew I wasn't going to see many people and I thought I'd just let it go and see. The the, the, the crazy thing is I always loved the colour. I, I Even when I first started dyeing it when I was in my 30s, I loved the colour and I thought then when I'm 45, I had in my head, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to have a crop and just have this silver crop. And then 45 came and I I was a single working mum, and as I've, I've, I've already explained, it it just didn't feel like the right time. So yeah, 2016, I was 50, and I just thought, I'm 57, by the way, you said I was 56 in the intro, I've just remembered. Oh. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> You've <laughs> had just, a birthday, have you I've then, I've had recently? a birthday in October. Um, so yeah, I was 50 you're, when you're, I was you're just to go You're just it. a little bit older than me then. <laughs> I, are you a 66 baby? I'm a 66 baby, I am. <laughs> so yeah, so I went for it in 2016 and did it during the six weeks that I was recovering from, uh, I had a upper abdominal hernia up and just kept going with it. And I, I honestly felt highly unattractive. It was a real struggle for two years. And then there was this kind of unveiling with friends when it was all cut off and... Um, and I was really nervous and anxious about that. And it wasn't very well received. People didn't say anything. And it wasn't until I went on, it was funny enough, it was young people that stopped me in the street to say they loved it. Young people were all about it. And that, that was nice. But my friends and, and family weren't particularly. <laughs> uh, and then when I went online uh, in 2020, all the women that were going through it during lockdown 
were there and they were sharing their transformation and and they found me which was amazing because I was the the end result and so I kind of got uh, connected with that community of silver sisters and the whole midlife thing as well kind of kind of married in the same space which was fantastic and I've loved being on Instagram it's been <laughs> it's been a creative outlet in lots of ways but also just just a platform to air my views and and uh and it's nice that people listen or or bother to read my captions <laughs> mm, mm. I just I it's funny because before I met you, I'd already profiled the Silver Sisters. I've, I've done a post all about them. I think there's about nine of them that I found. And I wrote, you know, an article asking them, you know, what they'd learned and what the problems had been with, with letting the hair go silver. And to me, it feels a little bit like the fact that if you come out as something other than heteronormative, you're constantly having to do that. And it yeah. feels a little bit like that with silver hair as well. Because of the culture that we're in, you've always got to explain your choice. You've always got, it's always something about you that people will comment on or think about or note or, or ask about. And it really shouldn't be. It should be so normal. But yeah. it's lovely that there are women out there, you know, normalising. And this is where I have to put my hand up and say, I don't dye my hair. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm 56 and this is the colour of my hair wow, and my mum's 88 amazing. and she's still got colour in her hair. I know it's I've very weird. I've never seen that. Yeah, I mean, I've got yeah. a friend who only recently, she's my age and my best friend from the age of four, she only recently started to get the odd one here and there. I've got some she's white got hairs brown. here, honest. You can't yeah. really see them, but in my fringe, I do have white hairs. And I wow. think, oh, look, there's another one. <laughs> but I, I have to say, I honestly do not have oh. my hair. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> um, I get asked now if I dye my hair, which I never got when I did dye my hair, <laughs> which is really, which is encouraging because, you know, it shows that people think it, it's a choice. So that's a well, nice grey is just another colour. That's what I well, would like it to be. Yeah, it's absolutely. just another colour. Absolutely. And I would, I would love it to not be linked with age as well. I know a lot mm. of young women uh, that I've met on Instagram, you know, in mm. their 30s that are fully grey. Some even younger in their 20s that are fully grey that have just stopped during lockdown and just decided to let it go. And it looks absolutely beautiful. It really does. Mm. It's it. It is just another colour, but I feel like it is quite special. It is because yeah, I it's think quite it's very unique. special other yeah, colour. Yeah, yeah, I do. I really want it to be normalised as just being another colour. But at the same time, I do think it's quite special in that you get your own kind of pattern. You know, not everybody's all white here. And, you yeah. know, you get streaks and you get yeah, some people yeah. just get a little white bit here. And I just think it's it's fun as well it's a it's a fun well that's how I feel when I start getting the white bits I'm thinking oh what's gonna yeah. happen there you know yeah. how, how is my hair going to change yes I'm envious of people yeah. that don't that because there's a few people now that are just going naturally gray and have never dyed it I've seen online that and seeing their journey over the last two years and seeing it multiply and what kind of you know pattern they get is I, I can't, I'm, you know, a little bit envious that I didn't experience that because I think that's that's a beautiful thing too to see it gradually happen. But your hair is spectacular. I Thank mean, it you. is just, <laughs> it is so taking. No, no. Not, 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 not taking sort the word. Um, taking sort the right word. What do you mean? You can't have um, it, Rachel. <laughs> no, can't joking. I? <laughs> it's so. Um, I don't know what the word's it. Not that word. Um, it's just. It grabs the attention. It's like, wow, it oh. just looks amazing. Oh, thank you. Fetching, I think. Fetching is perhaps the word. <laughs> Mother Nature gets all the, all the credit. <laughs> but it's so interesting for me. I remember, yeah, when we, when we were together, and I won't, I won't name names, but when, when we did our thing, there was a woman there who was saying, I don't know whether grey hair would suit me. Mm. And um, I remember thinking, why would it not suit mm. you? Mm, it's yeah. what you're it's what's supposed to happen to you naturally yes yeah, yeah. it's what happens as you as your skin changes so your hair color changes as you as you evolve yeah so why would it not suit you but I think that is 
you you presumably you went through the same thing would it would it suit you or not whereas in yeah. fact it, it looks spectacular yeah I, I I always loved it like I said I, I never questioned it was just the age thing if I'm you know that mm. that that mm. was the thing the link with being old looking old and society mm. not valuing me it was that mm. and nothing else I remember seeing a, a woman when I was young who had let her hair go silver when I was in probably in my, I say young I was in my 30s so that's young to me there was my friend's mother and she was you know obviously old enough to be my mum but still women that age were not were still dying their hair and she hadn't and I just thought it was so striking and so beautiful so I did have one reference point you know but I always like I said I always liked the colour but it was just about the stage of life that I was at I think as well and and not I, I'm, I often wonder had I been in a committed loving relationship and maybe run my own business <laughs> would I would I have worried so much about it, you know, like, because it really was those two things. It was really beauty, you know, beauty standards and, uh, and career, how society would, would write me off. Simple as that. So has your appreciation of what you see as old changed? Or are you no longer fearful of the grey hair putting you in the old box? I think I'm just really grateful to be part, well I feel like I'm part of a movement, you know, I feel like I'm part of a movement that is not just not just redefining ageing and, and, and being old but also, but undefining it as well, I mean when I was young really all you saw, and I, I've said this before really, for, for older people was either you know twin set and pearls and very conservative or wacky and eccentric and colorful it was those two extremes there was nothing kind of in between but that's in you know I'm talking about in marketing and just you know blue rinses and that sort of thing that's yes. all I saw when I was when I was a young woman so we never saw beyond that and I think also women in their 50s uh when I was you know when I when 50 was old enough to be my mother didn't shine I don't think they they kind of they just kind of blended in and I remember my mother saying at one stage I have, don't recall how old she was at the time I'd imagine in her 60s I remember her saying that she felt and it's funny because she would probably be annoyed with herself for saying this now because she's very different <laughs> now um, but she said I remember her saying that she quite enjoyed being a bit it, invisible not invisible she didn't use that language uh what was the word she used anonymous is what she said and not having to you know bother about what people thought about her and I know what she meant but she also meant blending in and not and not getting attention from whether that's from men or from other women or whatever just being not having to worry about how she presented herself she just kind of resigned herself to being old I suppose, um, at that time. I think she's changed very much since then. She got her first tattoo when she was 77 and she goes to jazz so clubs brilliant. and she's 83 <laughs> now. And she just has brilliant. a lovely life. You know, she enjoys being out and socialising and hanging out with my friends even. You know, she's on a Saturday, she's often seen in, in Portobello Road at bars and jazz music, listening to jazz music and whatever. So she's, she's, she's very much not blending in um anymore she's uh, so i feel she's grown and developed and i i definitely have i think i feel like there was absolutely nothing to fear once you take control of it i did i have to say during menopause i did hit a real low i had had 10 years of being a single parent and and very much single parent working full-time teenage daughters you know I got to a point and all those symptoms with menopause uh, I did get to a really low point and still and still dying the hair and panicking about you know but all of that led me to get to a point where I I feel like I kind of had to get there if I'm honest I think mm -hmm. getting to feeling really um low about uh who I was and what I was and what I meant in society even though I was doing a lot of 
meaningful work, everything, nothing was about me. You know, nothing was about, I was very giving. I was very uh, self-sacrificing, very selfless as a, as a pair, as a mum, as an employee, as, you know, my community meant so much to me. So I was doing whatever I could to, to, you know, to make sure other people were okay, but not taking care of myself and not actually addressing my needs. So I think I got to a point where I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm feeling all these symptoms. I hadn't recognised them as being menopausal symptoms. I had tinnitus, I had brain fog, I had, which meant that I got anxiety about going into meetings. You know, there were things going on that I didn't understand. And so I hit a low. And then there was real empowerment once I had spoken to a very, I was very fortunate and had a, a great GP who was a midlife woman and had take, made it her, you know, her mission to be an expert on menopause. So I was very, very lucky to find her, Dr. Jessica Barron. She's amazing. Anyway, and she, she knew immediately what the problems were. And, and that was the base for, for, for building blocks, you know, to kind of find myself again. And yeah, and I, I think once I knew what it was I was dealing with, once I had her support, it was just a time of empowerment, which then spilled into me going silver probably, you know, and letting my hair go. There was, um, I'm sure there was no coincidence with that. And also just embracing the age that I was, just just owning it, just owning it and just being very open about it and just um, and growing with it and realising that it is just what you make of it. It really is. It's, it's, it's like any stage in life. It is what you make of it. And yeah, and you can, you can, st- you're still growing and still evolving and still learning and and the other thing that I'm getting to grips with now as well is, so now I'm approaching what would be called senior, you know, I'm kind of coming out of midlife, which, which just occurred to me the other day, actually, I was like, I oh my God, We're I'm still to the end banging on about I midlife, know. but actually, <laughs> I, society may not be thinking otherwise, you know, I'm going to be eligible for a freedom pass very soon. <laughs> um, so. But the one thing that I hadn't thought about ever before, when you're on this kind of, you know, in this sort of transition period, so I'm currently, I'm sort of, you know, the older person in my age group, in the in my 50s, you know, I kind of, I've been there and I've done that and I've got people, you know, that look to me for answers. And I like that. But I'm also looking forward to being the newbie in the next cycle as well. I quite like the idea of, of, you know, learn, oh, this is a new space. What can I do here? And who can I learn from here? You know, I quite, I'd never thought of that before, but I quite like the idea of being the young person in <laughs> in the new space, the newbie in the new space. So I'm not fearful of the next stage. There, are, Don't get me wrong. There are things about mobility and things that we have to kind of, I guess we've got to kind of um, do our best to, to to be healthy and to you know to take care of ourselves and be more mindful of that than than we had to when we were younger although we should have been investing in that when we were younger and hopefully somebody will learn that from me um <laughs> but <me>. yes <laughs> there, there's all that yeah there is all of that you know that when you look when I look at my mum's generation and see you know what they're going through and their issues and you know their friends are passing away and and that is not you know that's not something obviously anybody's going to look forward to but there are beautiful things about that stage as well and being around to see you know your grandkids or your great-grandchildren or the delights of the world my mum went to Morocco on her own in her you know her late 70s and you know there's there's still things to be done yeah yeah Yes, I think we, we can get so fixated with the negative, can't we? And and not see all of the positives. Because in fact, I, 
I'm reading a, a lovely book. Well, I'm listening to it. It's called Elderhood. And I've actually written about approaching my elderhood. And I like that term, elderhood. Yeah. But I also had a woman who, she wrote a post for me on, on my magazine site quite a long time ago now. And she talked about turning 60. Mm. And she described it as entering the youth of her old age. Yes, and e I love Each of that. our ages. I know, it's good, isn't it? But yeah. I like youth of elderhood. Yeah. I'm going to change yeah, the old yeah, age yeah. to elderhood. Because I like the old age. I have a problem with old and and this book is challenging me on that. So mm. I, I don't like the idea that age is so binary. Yeah, <laughs> We're yeah. moving away from the binary in so many aspects. But in terms of age, we seem to go from young to old. Yeah, And there yeah. are so many flavors in between. There's yeah. so many stages. So I don't mind being an older woman. And I don't mind that I'm youth, entering the youth of my elderhood. Mm. I think that is quite fun. And like you, I'm interested in in being yes i'll be in kindergarten again we'll, yes, we'll be back in kindergarten yeah, exactly. in terms of our life stage yeah. how do we how do we grapple with this what can we learn from it and i love that that you know there are people like there are women like you and me out there saying these kind of things and talking about these kind of things instead of oh my god i'm turning 60 it's the end of yeah, life yeah. because it's not there's a whole next chapter there's a whole 30 40 years yeah. of if we're life. lucky if we're lucky if yeah. we're lucky yeah, yeah exactly and 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 it is lucky you know that's 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 the other thing is just practicing gratitude you know like i i have never been more grateful for life <laughs> do you know in in than i am now or than i have been in the last sort of five years you know i complained about silly things that I would never dream of complaining about now I'm so grateful to be here you know like I and to be healthy and and yeah I, I just so I you know the, going back to what you were saying about old as well I feel it does feel like it's not a, a dirty word but it does feel it has such negative connotations to it mm. I did write a post about that because the dictionary actually says you know old can mean outdated and you know and irrelevant and whatever it said I can't remember but it, you know and it can just mean simply that you've been around a long time <laughs> you know um and obviously I'm the latter I have been around for a long time so I could be called old if that was the only definition of it but when it's linked with outdated and you know and I can't remember what the other words were but they were you know you get the gist of it it's it's mm. it's that you're not um, of relevance anymore. When when it's linked with that, it is. I, I do like elderhood. I'm. I'm. I'm mm. I think that's a good one. Thank you for that, Rachel. I, I like it. I like. So I'm very comfortable that I'm. I'm going to be an elder. Yes. Yeah. I. Yeah. I. I do refer. I've got you know people that I've met because I worked in in the in a community centre at when I worked for Notting Hill Carnival. I worked in a community centre and we had old people of the next generation, the older generation, and we refer to them as elders in, in our community mm. and they like, they they do mm. with each other as well. So, so yeah, elders is, is a nice one. I like that there's a, there's a certain esteem, I think, that's put with it. And um, I think so much of our language about getting older, about old age is so negative and mm. so disrespectful I was and just lacking in not giving dignity yes. and not even appreciating but dismissing yes whereas elder to me elder it feels like there's an element of respect I there was just going to say exactly and appreciation. the same thing. yeah yeah I yeah like that. it does sound respectful doesn't it mm. yeah well, we you be... will respect me. <laughs> I have reached the, <laughs> I have reached the age of being time. an elder. <laughs> yeah, I've been lucky enough to be here for a long time. You can call me an elder. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm looking forward to being a, a youthful elderly. A, a, uh, what, yeah. what was the expression? I love that. The, the youth, uh, well, she wrote about the youth of my old age, but yeah. I, I'm changing that. I'm making it the youth of my elderhood. elderhood yeah, I'm rolling with that one too. It's good, isn't it? I, like, I like that idea. Yeah. But I do, think I do think <laughs> language around aging yeah. is, oh, is, yes. has really got to change, you know. Mm -hmm. And I do have conversations behind the scenes, being in the industry that I'm in and working with brands. 
Um, I do have conversations behind the scenes about the language used around products and marketing and, and you know, I do work towards, I'd, I actually like to do consultancy, I can't, you know, with brands about particularly that, but also how they, pre how they present us and how, and I do do it for free. So, <laughs> you know, I do do my best to make a difference behind the scenes. So yeah, that's something I'd quite like to get into because I think it's really important, the language that we use and the connotations so around important. it, like anti-aging. Yeah. You know, I can't bear that. that. Yeah, just, yeah, it's... anti, yeah. It's just not cool. So yeah, I no. think there's lots of work to be done yet, for sure. But we're doing it. We're doing it. We're out yeah. there. We're doing it. Yeah, we are. <laughs> I, and it, it's funny because the modelling, so I, I do the modelling, but it's it's led to other stuff as well. So the modelling has kind of led to, well, the online, I don't you know, but I, I get called an influencer. I'm not really comfortable with that, I have to say. Um, but I, you know, I kind of work with brands on, on my Instagram page. And it, that's led to public speaking. I've done some panels around the topic of hair and beauty and and aging. I always bring aging into the mix. If I'm booked to do something about hair, I can't talk about that without talking about the issues surrounding being my age. So yeah, that's led to that. And hopefully I will be doing more podcasts. And um, I'm writing a book. I've just been approached by a literary agency. And I've just signed with them, actually, to do Excellent. a book. Yeah, so, um, you know, I feel like there's lots more work to be done. And I'm really ready to do it. I've never been more, more motivated. I've never been more motivated. I've been equally motivated. But I've never been more mm. motivated than I am And you've I got the platform, now. haven't you? You've got the platform to do something with it. I feel, yes, and, and I'm building on that as well. You know, it's really it's important to, if you've got, if you have that, to, to make use of it. Yeah, for sure. Just shout. <laughs> just just be, just, yeah. And I, I think it's not, it's, it's for my generation as well. Like, I, you know, I want to help to redefine and to connect with as many people as possible of my generation, but... But and I said it was a surprise that younger people have, um, you know, have resonated with younger people. But really, it's for them. Like I really feel like I don't want my kids, my daughters, and in fact, both of my daughters, and they hadn't conferred because I asked them. Both of my daughters said on separate occasions to me um, that they can't wait to be middle aged. <laughs> I was like, yes, really? my work is done. <laughs> yeah. They can't wait. Well, that's because... how your work is done. Good on you. Good, <laughs> good mothering there. Wow. Well, I was I, like, well, it's so slow important. down. Enjoy your time now. You know, I think that's the key. No, but if, they, but if they're but... not fearful, it's like yeah. I say about menopause, you know, let's be prepared, not scared. Because if yeah. we're scared, it's going to be worse. Yeah. If we're not prepared and we don't know what's coming, it's going to be worse. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So I think if, if your daughters are not fearful but can see it, as another life stage, yeah. which has its own problems, but also has its own bounty. Yes, you know, exactly, exactly. That, that's fantastic. And it's so true, like you said, each stage of life has its own problems. Like, my my only thing that I, that I worry about now with getting old is mobility and health, you know, physical stuff. I can see that there's so much more living to do and so much to be done. But that's that's the only thing that I kind of, you know, would be would be concerned about. And when you're young, it's probably, you know, how you carve out your life for yourself, you know, in the future. Or maybe it's silly stuff about, you know, body image, because, you know, that's what we're taught. And I say silly stuff. It's not. It meant at that time it was so important to me. And it's still I'm, as I said, I'm still unpacking a lot of that. But it's the stuff that you won't worry about when you're older is what I'm saying. So when I'm in my 80s, I would hope I'm no longer going to be worried about body image and more about just living a good <laughs> life and a fulfilled full life and being mobile. So yeah, each stage comes with its own worries, but it also comes with fantastic things too and opportunity and, you know, and learning and developing and growing and, and all that good stuff. Well, health and wellness becomes less about 
how we look and how we move uh, yeah it? it's absolutely. about how we move how we stay active our mobility i've started yeah. squatting i could never squat to save my life but i've actually <laughs> improved my squat because i'm doing it every day yeah. and i know that that's good for my hip mobility and it's good for my long-term mobility so yeah. i'm not doing it i'm not doing anything to lose weight yeah you know? i'm doing things to build strength absolutely that's what i'm doing that, that's that is the difference with me now as well. When I was young, I was literally on that treadmill chasing an, a body that was never going to be mine. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, it was not my body type that I was running, you know, frantically running towards on this treadmill. It just wasn't ever going to happen. And now it is totally not, I've totally accepted my body type. Um, and I am all about, my health and mobility and 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 yeah and strength I, I must admit i'm going through a lull at the moment with um with exercise i'm finding it difficult to get motivated and i think that's just, but that's okay yeah. it's january yeah that's fine <laughs> i'm you know, going like, through a weird don't, stage don't at beat moment. yourself over the head about yeah, that goodness yeah, that's fine I've, I've got to get back into it because i do i've got osteoporosis so i have to i have to work on my strength yeah so yeah yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm human. So, you know, we do have these, these lulls and also just really busy at the moment. It's, I've got a lot, a lot going on. <laughs> well, this has been such a delightful conversation and thank you very much. So just, just as we wind up, what would you most want my listeners to know? Um, what demographic are your listeners? Just... Do you Ooh, know, <laughs> just, it's just they're generally women, I think, 40 up. I don't think I don't think I have very many younger listeners. I would love to have more younger listeners. But yeah. I think there's generally sort of 45, 50, 55, I'm guessing. Okay. Tell me, listeners, where, <laughs> what age are you? <laughs> um, uh, gosh, I don't. Uh, do you know, this is the thing with me is that I don't overthink things and I'm not sort of Calcul calculated with my content on social media like I don't I I just put it out there and think hope that it resonates with people um and often I'm lucky enough that it, often it does so when I get asked questions like that I'm like oh my god what do I say because I don't well you've already said loads of it so <laughs> just give me another gem to go out with <laughs> um I on my bio on my Instagram I've just put my the battle was won when I stopped fighting and by that I mean I mean the aging you know like just when I stopped fighting aging when I stopped thinking about the negatives with aging when I stopped thinking how society might view me because of how I looked because I looked older rather than what I can bring and 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 I've just been just I guess it's just being mindful that you're more than than how you look I suppose or how you're more than how society views you you if you value that if you value what you bring as I saw recently someone saying walk into a room as if they need you because they do. And I thought, I love that because everybody brings something. Do you know what I mean? It's like everybody brings something to the table. It's like, it's just be, just being yourself, just owning yourself, owning your age, owning who you are, creating your space in society. And I think it all, it all flows once you've come to terms with that, once you've owned it, once you know your value, it all just flows that's that definitely been my experience just just being comfortable as, as more comfortable than I've ever been in my skin and and knowing my worth and knowing my value and I'm walking into a room knowing that I bring something and and also valuing other people and understanding other people too you know and 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 sisterhood. Sorry, I'm not going to shout out now. And sisterhood. Sisterhood is so key and so important. Friends and connecting with people for, for fundamental uh, 
you know, reasons, core, core reasons and galvanizing, you know, just supporting women, supporting women, all of that good stuff is important, whatever age you are, but more so at our age, I think, because what society has taught us about this stage, I just think it's really important. I just one last thing around aging as well and how important it is for us to to create it a space kim kardashian who i'm really proud to say i've never watched an episode but of course she's on everywhere and on my radar she said the other day that if she was told that if she ate her own poo she would look younger yeah if she ate her own poo daily she would look younger she probably would do it and that is so <laughs> So toxic for, on so many levels <laughs> um but that's what young you know young people she's got millions of followers and viewers and stuff and young people are hearing that and I just think had she someone like that just how powerful would it be if someone like that had just owned it so it's down to us to counter that and show what it what it really looks like what it can be and how it's not to be feared Thanks for listening to this episode of the Magnificent Midlife Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, follow and share it. Also, giving a five-star review really helps get the word out. You'll find the show notes at magnificentmidlife.com. That's also where you can get my book, Magnificent Midlife, Transform Your Middle Years, Menopause and Beyond. Make the very best of your next chapter. Help me change the world, one magnificent midlife woman at a time.